me take a minute and pray for us, and then we will turn it over to Beth. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning and this opportunity to just be together. Uh, God, I thank you so much for these leaders, for what you're doing in them and through them. There is so much incredible ministry work represented on this call today. And we're just grateful uh, to all be a part of, uh, of the same team. We're all doing something different, but we're all working together to uh, impact others and, and build the kingdom and advance the gospel. God, I thank you again for this time. We pray that you would just bless Beth in a special way as she presents today and help us to hear exactly what you want us to hear. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Beth, take it away. Thank you very much. Let me just get my uh, get my view adjusted here. All right. Well, I am just so thankful to be here today, and, and thanks to Venture One Nine for the invitation. And as we work through the ideas um, with both Jonathan and Heather, um, trying to get something that would be useful to all of you. But I'm very honored to be here. Um, and I think one of the things you're going to hear, I hope you hear today, is that I'm very passionate about this idea of how important it is to pay attention to the front end of the storytelling process. How do we gather stories? How do we identify stories? I'm hoping that that passion comes through today and uh, hope to share that with people. And again, encourage uh, ongoing communication uh, about how we can make it better to make known how God is working in the world through everything that you all are doing. Put this here, there we go. In this workshop today, I have really high hopes that, um, um, you know, again, that I can share the passion and, um, and to be able to talk about some of the easy ways that we can, and you'll hear some easy ways that you can make some changes. We'll be looking at the story gathering process in three sections, which uh, uh, um, Jonathan just mentioned. mentioned. First of all, I am passionate about the fact that I believe that um, community-based staff, community-level staff, people who do not have degrees or training in communications can be story gatherers. I believe that volunteers can be story gatherers. And even at times, some of your program participants can be story, story gatherers and that you can help them to identify compelling stories. Uh, number two, and we'll take a break after that section. Number two, I do believe too, that it's possible for you to uh, gather stories more efficiently and more effectively, and very maybe perhaps more more important too, that you can gather those stories. Uh, much of what you can do doesn't cost a whole lot of money. A lot of it is uh, being organized, thinking about uh, your your um, processes, and being able to come with ways to get better stories. And the other part that we will go into at the end is a little bit about how using story internally can really help to train your staff, boost morale amongst staff and, and volunteers in your organization. Jumping right in here, um, I, I wanna start off with this fantastic graphic, which is about what makes a story compelling. And I think it's really important for everyone who is involved in the story gathering process to be on the same page about what compelling means. Uh, your, your goal is here to reach these big red square that says compelling story. And you can see boring story where you don't want to be down in the other corner. And what does make a compelling story is a combination of having the right balance between the facts in the story and what they, they say an entertaining story here. And it, it really does mean stories that show emotion, stories that, that grab people's emotions. I like the word engaging better than the word entertaining, but you need to find stories that have that balance. And uh, one of the ways that, uh, this again, sorry. This is my notes in the wrong place. Um, there are some specific ways to help make stories both factual and entertaining. Details in the story help anchor your story, make it sound factual, 
and make it more authentic. And that's a big word today. A lot of us are probably struggling with uh, how do we get younger donors? And authenticity is a big word that they would use amongst themselves as well. Uh, the more, if you have details about the situation, the context, the person, it is more, uh, more authentic and more compelling. And we'll talk a little bit more about the use of statistics as a specific type of fact later on. Details about what people think or feel boosts authenticity as well. Uh, strong visuals. I think we all know that that adage of uh, a picture paints a thousand words is absolutely true. And one of the way, things that I do have to push um, clients on sometimes is making sure that the photos show emotion. We can be really good at taking pictures that just report things, a building that's been completed, for example. But you have to have people to have emotions. Uh, and showing that emotion in the story really helps out. Uh, another trend that I'm seeing in storytelling, too, is going toward first person. I know of a couple of organizations who have uh, made a promise that they will only print a story in a first person narrative from the person who is is telling the story. Uh, I know one of the others, though, is... Um, uh, Sorry about that. I think you hope you didn't get that link on your screen that I just got. Um, the first person, another way to do that is to make sure that you get quotes in the stories. And I do see a lot of people leaving that out as well. But getting direct quotes, particularly about how, how somebody thinks or feels and it, the change. How did they think at the beginning? How did they think at the end? And then finally, I wanted to bring out that it's okay to, to I said, leave a gap, leave a gap for your supporter to uh, either uh, pray or donate or, or take some sort of action and respond to your call to action. You, a, a good story, a compelling story doesn't have to be earth shattering. Um, you don't have to solve all of the problems in the community or all the problems of the, the program participant in one story. If you can do it, that's great, but those stories are really rare. Good stories can end with problems that are yet to solve, something that the supporter can, again, interact with, pray with, give to, uh, and, 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 and maybe even be uh, convinced to volunteer. The second part of finding best stories is I think that um, uh, it's just identifying and capturing those stories you tell each other. Human beings are natural storytellers. Um, I thought about as I was putting this together, remembered my little brother would, uh, when he was, he was he's seven years younger than I am. So when he was two or three, uh, my family's habit was to sit around and tell stories of our day at the dinner table. We'd sit down, we had a pot of tea and we all told stories and, you know, he could string sentences together, but his stories were totally and completely made up. And I just love one of the things I loved about my mom is that he would say a sentence and, and mom would go, uh-huh, tell me more. And mom was great. I mean, it was like a, a master class in improv uh, at the table. He loves, and he still loves telling stories. We joke about it. But it, it, very early in life, people really love to tell stories. So where is your storytelling happening? And I'm going to give some examples here. Every organization is unique. But take a pause. Think about where are we telling stories? How are we communicating stories between each other or even to our loved ones after work? things like that. First of all, regular reporting, you all probably have some sort of regular reporting that's going on to supporters. Do you have, when you have those monthly reports due, schedule some time as a communications person, as a leader in an organization, schedule some time to really read through it. I use a highlighter. I have a yellow highlighter right here. This is my friend. I go through and I highlight as I go through and I usually read on in paper. I find I, I absorb things better on paper. Uh, highlight where you might want communications people to follow up, uh, where you might want to assign a story later on. Um, celebrations, which are scheduled. Again, you know when those are coming up, but those are fantastic for telling stories of accomplishments and, and, and stories of change as well. And, you know, one of the cautions I have on that is imagery of people speaking or video of people speaking, long speeches, um, I, I would get uh, I would get back from uh, my field offices sometimes uh, picture after picture after picture of dignitaries lined up just standing there looking at the camera. Those aren't terribly compelling. What you need to do is is have some fun things going on during the celebration and taking taking uh, imagery of that, getting stories of people. Think about it as being a um, 
a news broadcast, a stand up at a, at a fun event. Um, and you can, you can interview leaders, you can interview parents, uh, you can interview staff, you can interview volunteers. That can be a lot of fun to put that video together. And then the third thing that I'd bring out, and again, this isn't an exhaustive list, is who are you praying about? What are you praying about? If your staff is getting together and doing regular devotionals, uh, when the time is right on those stories, sometimes your prayer, your prayer targets are very confidential and, and the people are very vulnerable, so it's not a good time to share the story. But keeping track of those, those items and being, going back and saying, hey, I think this would make a good story. Uh, I had a, a group uh, in one country that I was working with that um, consistently complained that they didn't know how to identify stories. And uh, it was bad enough. I ended up going into the country to do some work with them. And I realized that they had a prayer journal, that they were, they were keeping track of their prayers. And I said, when I send you a request, do you ever look at the prayer journal to see what you've been praying about, what stories you've been telling each other and what stories you've been talking to God about? And they said, you know, we never thought of that. And it was part of the road to that team feeling more confident that they were able to identify stories. If you only remember one thing about this section, I would say it's this one. To identify a good story, look for change. Or you could use uh, the, the phrase, how is God working? I am trying to uh, inculcate a habit in myself at the end of every day to say, how did you see God working today? And it really helps to be able to, um, not only is it a morale booster, but it can help you identify good stories. And again, let me emphasize in this very, fam this very famous analogy here of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly, you don't have to look for a story where it's gone from caterpillar to butterfly. Caterpillar to chrysalis is just fine. It will, it can make for a good story, particularly for something short like a social media post um, or even some blog posts. You can use the story to illustrate something else, a bigger, bigger context or a bigger issue. I mentioned that I would be talking about statistics. This was something as I was talking with Venture One Nine about putting this together that it would be healthy and, and helpful, hopefully, to make some comments about this. I was an English major in school. <laughs> I've taken statistics um, but uh, for psychology and, um, and for educational learning, and it's it's really not my, my beat. But you know what? Over the years, I have come to enjoy getting into stacks of statistics about something because I can see the stories in there. Um, but here are some things about using statistics. I mean, they can be gold nuggets, but Keep in mind that um, when you're using statistics and stories, usually one, if, you, if you're doing a, a particularly a, a story of one, as we call it, you're, you're, you're um, focusing on one person. Uh, one statistic is usually enough, maybe two. Uh, you don't need to uh, sprinkle statistics all throughout. You'll lose people. Um, making sure that the statistics are understandable. This is particularly, uh, if you're working with really big statistics, now I'm not... Uh, and and so um, it, one of the examples that I, I've had is uh, we we distributed eight tons of food to somebody. You know, that's a lot. People can't envision eight tons. So some suggestions here, um, instead of saying we helped 500 people this year, you could say um, we helped 600 people this year, which is 20% more than last year. Do you see what I mean? The comparing the two. And the statistic becomes the change, especially if it's positive change. So when I look for in a report, I'm looking for those statistics that show that positive change. 20% more is a little easier to understand than, than even 500. Um, another example that I did some research on just for this is uh, we, we provided 40,000 pounds of food. And so I looked to see what the carrying capacity of the average trucks in this country is. And um, didn't like the semi answer when it was all over the boards, but they said, well, the average box truck holds 10,000 pounds. So I could say we provided the equivalent of four box trucks of food. It takes a little work on that prayer uh, work. And, and I say accountability, you know, not to misuse the stats, but that's a good way to bring stats down to a level people can understand. Um, as I mentioned too, my next point here talks about um, uh, scanning reporting for what uh, for changes. And I've already mentioned, yep, if you can see that change, that's where I pull out my trusty yellow highlighter. And then, uh, you know, one thing that's that's really um, this is all based on is that you have to have some measurable 
uh, statistics, some measurable, measurable goals to be able to do those statistics. And so uh, I would encourage you if you're you're struggling on that, I mean, that would be an area for coaching for some of you possibly um, to be able to uh, to be able to uh, have those statistics to go back to. And one of the things that I have lacked a lot is I'm working and I, I work not only with my own organization that I was at for 28 years, I also worked with a lot of partner organizations doing training in disaster response. And I would work with them to help them boost their storytelling. And one of the things I said, please make sure that you capture the beginning of this process that hole in the ground that's going to become a latrine or a bank of latrines, capture putting the foundation in for a new building, uh, capture the first day of school and know what your statistics are for the start so that you can do that comparison later on. Even doing interviews um, with uh, with community leaders and all they can do is complain about, uh, about what the problems are. And I've had some people say, I don't want to do that. They're just going to complain. And it's like, we have those in the bank because when things get better, even pulling those out to show those people can be really amazing. You know, they can see the change themselves. Don't forget as well, uh, I've been talking in terms of you're getting, getting stories from program participants or care receivers, as may be the case. But for, don't forget your staff and volunteers have their own trans, uh, transformation stories. Those can be very powerful and particularly volunteers. They're, they're unpaid to give you a testimonial uh, about how they've been changed. And those are very, very uh, good at helping people to um, helping people to maybe get engaged with you in ways more than giving money as well to be a, a, a prayer partners or even to become volunteers themselves. I'll stop here. That was a, a long, uh, long and a lot of information. Let's see what kind of questions we have, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Beth. Uh, Mary is wondering, when you're dealing with statistics, does the source of those statistics need to be included or mentioned if they're from an outside source? So if you're using some uh, outside source stats to share your story, should those be should those be referenced? I often do. Uh, reference them, especially if I'm talking about the context of, in the community, for example, a literacy statistic or a health certificate statistic. Now in, in marketing, something like the trucks, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have the reference included in what I send out. Um, I would have it. I would know where I got it from in case uh, somebody questioned it. Mm -hmm. But um, um, you know, that's another one of those things. Take a look at your brand, take a look at your, your donors. What would they expect um, and be able to do that. I mean, the default can always be, yes, it's always good just to have a little reference on it to say where you got it from. Well, and I think if you're looking at an outside study, Mary, I would say this too, uh, mentioning that study uh, can add extra credibility, right? To the statistics that you're, you're sharing. People know that it's not just an in-house statistic or something that you grabbed from who knows where, but uh, but you're you're highlighting where it came from, and again, I think that can add some uh, that can mm -hmm. add some credibility. Beth, mm -hmm. I love what you said about uh, getting more detailed. So your your example of providing the food, but breaking that down into the number of box trucks, like right away, that paints a picture for me in my mind, and now I have an idea of how much food was provided. Uh, and so I think really uh, using stories to break things down, paint the picture so that people can continue to, to see that in their own mind, I think is great. I loved, I love that example. And then Beth, one other thing you mentioned just real quick, sharing the story of one, as you called it. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that means? Because uh, I agree with you. It's a very effective way to share stories. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I have seen over the years, and I, I tell stories the same way, uh, there is a story of a community, a whole community, a whole city, a whole school being transformed. But in order to make that real, in order to get the emotion that moves you into that compelling box, you need to focus on one person. It can be very short. You can even have a blog post, for example, where the blog post is probably 10 to 15 
paragraphs, but three of those paragraphs focus on one person. And you just have a headshot of that one person talking about something. There's a lot more that you could do with the story of one as well. But I find myself, I was reading some missionary newsletters last night, a whole pack of missionary newsletters. And you know, the one that really stuck out and, and someone said to me, this one is really simple. Well, I read it and it was just about um, how the missionary had helped somebody through a very serious medical crisis. Very simply written, um, very, you know, short words, short sentences all the way through. That's the one that got my attention. It wasn't so much talking about, yes, we met with the community, head of the community today, <laughs> you know, and, and had a meeting because I know our rea our reality is, of course, and I had, I worked as the, um, I supervised the child sponsorship um, organization in, in Bolivia. And my day was meetings, 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 meetings. That was it. And just talking with everybody and long meetings because Bolivians are so friendly and they have to feed you uh, in this, this context. So, uh, you know, that's, that's reality. And that's, it was much better just going into that story of just one person, just the one person focus. True for video as well. Yeah, love that. And uh, and and I love the point of communicating the change, right? What uh, what what if and it even connects with the story of one. What was going on with this individual before, right? Then they engaged your work and God did something special. And now, what happened as a result of that? And so communicating the change and, and using that to, to communicate about one specific person or one specific situation. Love that. All right, Beth, that uh, that's it for, for now. So fire away on the next section. Fire away the next one. And I was, uh, I did some magic with my, uh, there we go. I'm back. So now I want to move into talking about the process of gathering stories and there are three key areas that I usually break things down into when I'm working with clients to make sure that you're getting the inventory of storytelling media that you need. That's really what we're talking about here. How do I get that inventory that has the has what I need? First of all, you need to get the right content, content that uh, is compelling, uh, content that has the right information in it. Secondly, we need to get the right quality. Uh, and I would say right now, Phil, uh, my images and my video have been places where I've struggled even more than the writing and getting the right quality uh, of, of uh, images and video. I don't have time today to go into some of the uh, some of the things I found really positive um, about that that have really worked. But um, again, um, separately or, or after that, we can talk a little bit more about that. The third thing is getting the right content, the right quality on time. And we all know that that can be a struggle at times. Uh, so I mean, to, as you start this process of trying to figure out how can we do something with our story gathering process, you know, analyze what's going well. That's always where you want to want to start. Um, I, I think they've, they're calling it something now, but I'm a big fan of asset-based community development, meaning you go in and you say, what's working here? You don't just go in and say, what's the problem? You say, what's working? Same thing for this process. See what's going well. And then, you know, also look what your barriers are. But I can't emphasize enough. It's just not a matter of process, the process on a whiteboard. It's having the right people in the room to have the discussion. You really need to do some work on identifying who the stakeholders are in your story gathering process, going down to uh, engage your community level staff and volunteers in the discussion. I know we have a lot of community level staff here with mentor kids today, for example, get them involved and, and even involve community leaders and program participants. Community leaders can be incredible sources for you for, for good storytelling, get them involved. So I want to break out each of those three areas and just comment a little more about them. Um, first of all, um, the very beginning of the process is most important. And I, I'd have to say the last three years of my, my professional life with one organization, we worked really hard at this front end and saw really good results from it, meaning that 80% of our stories were coming in on time, which was great. And this is 17 countries I was working with. So it, it really made a difference. Um, consider, and this is what really changed it for us, consider developing a written story brief. If you can even call it a creative brief, because that can make your people feel, oh, wow, I'm now a communications person. You know, I can, I can speak that language. That's great. Open that up for them. 
develop a written story brief, which can be just a formatted email is the best way to do it. Just get an email out, very simple. Um, this is probably hard to see on the screen. You may not be able to read everything, um, but when you get it, when you get the um, uh, when you get it by email, or if you see it on the web later, you'll be able to read it. But um, it, you know, tell them what the story you hope the story will contain and accomplish. What format you need it in? Is it is it a video? Is it and how long the video is? What um, talk a little bit about? Uh, do I need it? It needs to be 1080p. I mean, you usually have to put that in as well. Tell them I won't accept it. I can't accept anything lower because of how I need to use it. Um, tell them when it's due, and then tell them when it's due again <laughs> twice. I usually put it in the uh, in the um, in the subject line, which sometimes means that people, oh, it's not due until November the first, uh, and so I don't have to open it until October thirtieth. But that usually isn't the case if they know that it's a story. Um, and I'll, I'll put in that it, I found that I had to give people at least a month's notice to be able to get anything. Um, second, um, I, I think that um, um, being specific about who it is that needs to receive it and the pathway for sending it in, that will help you with your quality level um, very, very much so that you're not like getting somebody drop it off at your desk on a piece of um, loose leaf notebook paper, uh, making sure that they know what it's supposed to be written in. Another um, important aspect of getting the right quality isn't about process. It's about getting the right people on the job. And this may be actually the most important thing, finding those folks who seem to have a talent for storytelling, who really get into it. Um, you know, I was, I've, I've been fortunate over the years to work in an organization that employed an awful lot of teachers and social workers. Boy, did they know how to write a story of one, especially the social workers. I mean, they were used to doing case studies and uh, and having to write, write you know, caseworker notes. And they were great at getting the details. Um, the second part of that is giving them time to do the work. You can't gather a story in 20 minutes. I've been doing this for 30 years, more than 30 years. I've been doing this for over 40 years. And it still takes me an hour to get a decent story with somebody. Part of it is making the person comfortable. It takes me 20 minutes, especially if I go into a, a, a foreign country, a culture that's not my own, especially if I have to work in translation. Uh, it takes a while for people to get comfortable. And you can, I put this picture here of people going side by side. I found that doing side by side interviewing works much better especially uh, there are many cultures in this world where where sitting like you're doing a 60 minutes interview is very confrontational. Even in our, in my, um, you can see, I, I will claim my WASP heritage, um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heritage. And even in my culture, it, it's very confrontational. So sitting side by side, it's more like a conversation and you're holding you know, holding a phone and recording in one hand. I can talk more about that. That's something I'm prepared to talk about one-on-one -on -one with organizations as well. Um, you know, um, it, it, so, it, I mean, it's not just a matter of, um, you know, finding the right people, but making sure that managerial staff feel that they have permission to give people time, make it clear that that's just part of how we operate. Um, so one thing I would do as, a, as somebody who was in a, a central office communication position is I would, um, when a good story or a good photo came in, and sometimes they just seemed to leap off the page, I made sure that we know who actually gathered it, who was part of it, and ask if it's possible for that person to do more of that type of work. Um, usually that's a motivating conversation with the staff member to know that their talent has been recognized. It can be. Downside is sometimes when you say, well, could you do more of this, then the, the uh, result can be, well, we can talk about putting it in my job description and compensating it for me for it. So I wanted to recognize that here <laughs> and say that, yes, that is something you have to work through. Uh, and and I, you know, I don't know that um, uh, I can't give you a, a blueprint for that because it depends on the person in the situation. But it, that's one reason why, and I keep coming back to this, everything I'm telling you, you're not going to roll this out in six weeks. Oftentimes it takes a couple of years. You need to make a plan and, and back into it, you know, roll into it little by little by little, do some testing on it, do things like looking at job descriptions, perhaps as you're hiring people, think about is does this job open itself up 
to somebody being a storyteller. And I, I know already, I think I'm going to get a lot of questions about this in the question time or when I get one-on-one -on -one with people. I've been through it. Um, relationships are everything. Relationships are everything in storytelling. So let me answer this question. This, it may be an unasked question. Why did I not put technology barriers at the top of the list here for um, things that you need to think about for quality? Well, because I, I have found that surmounting technology is easier than surmounting the people, the, the people problem and the time problem, um, especially, especially since we have these now. I mean, because I'm from back in the day where it was a film camera. Um, and a, a you know, recorder was even, I, I, at least they did have handheld um, voice machines when I, when I started in this, but really tough. Um, so that's one of the barriers I, I have here. I don't have equipment, can be a cop out. That's taken, um, I thought about changing that wording and I said, I'm going to let it go. But that's, I have, have gotten that argument. I'll ask a, a, a community staff member as I, I need photos and it's, yeah, you're breaking up, you're breaking up, you know, the, <laughs> They can't hear me on the phone. I have technology problems. Um, and so we have to get down to, you know, why did they think that's a barrier? And that usually ends when I get that kind of a reaction, I go back and say, okay, tell me more. Tell me more about your barriers. I, it's important these days to rethink our definition of quality as well. Uh, and that's been a struggle within um, marketing, nonprofit marketing world that I go in. Um, TikTok is... For our younger donors, particularly, and by younger, I mean anybody under 65, um, that that TikTok style video or that that that, you know, that um, the vertical video works very well for most of your public, most of your, your communications, for many of them, especially for social media. Um, cameras taken with a cell phone are very, very good these days. Um, you do need professionals from time to time. And again, I, one of the things that I, I list myself as being able to talk about is, okay, how do we make that decision, professional, non-professional? And then how do we work to get the best that we can out of the professional since they're expensive? You need to be working to get the best, you know, make the most out of your investment. But high quality publications, let's see, you have a magazine of some sort, um, big screen presentations, you know, something that's not just going to be on the web. Uh, longer videos, if you're going to, going to be doing something like a documentary style. Websites these days, the style is for huge, huge photos. You're probably going to need a professional to take some of those iconic photos that are used. But for social media, blog, many of the print newsletters that you do, um, a cell phone image or a video with a cell phone will do. And and mentioning again, you know, these these plans to mitigate some of your technical issues don't have to happen overnight. This is, uh, as far as the training part of it goes and the coaching, pick some of your best performers to pilot for a, a, a fiscal year and plan for uh, the wider rollout in, in following years. And that allows you time to, to develop a training program. You don't have to do it all at once. Start off with some, some testers. Start, start off with some good, strong pilot people. And uh, yeah, we do have some questions coming up. I will um, um, get through some of these uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's important to make sure though that your staff do have access to technical equipment. I have seen some people require standardized cell phones or have a cell phone that they check out. Um, I had not personally experienced that to be that that good of a um, methodology and that those cameras break. And then everybody goes, what do I do? I can't get any stories. The camera's broken, you know, and, and technology moves so fast. I, I got cameras out to 17 countries at one point. The cameras were pretty were outdated and didn't meet technical specs within two years. And so then I had another 17 cameras to get. So. Uh, that's, I can do some advising on that, but it is a possibility. Most cell phones, if they've been within the last four years, I did some uh, studies of my organization that I used to work for, and we found that most people had a cell phone that was perfectly, uh, a personal cell phone that could be used. And you can, we'd put together a, a one pager, both for video and for photography on, here are some of the basic settings that you need to have on your phone in order to get us what we need. And that has worked really well as well. And then giving feedback when it came in wrong to say, hey, you didn't do this right. Feedback, really key in all of this. <laughs> and then the last thing I want to uh, talk about here um, is um, um, 
developing opportunities for regular training. And one of the best things that I have seen our whole industry going to, if we want to call it an industry, is uh, communities of practice. And that means getting together the people who have been assigned to be storytellers uh, and, and getting them together periodically, maybe quarterly, just to talk. You can use that for your coaching. Feedback on what worked and what didn't is highly, highly important. I tried many ways to do that. I found the community of practice was by far, by far the best. I was putting uh, uh, examples in Google Drive and sending out a newsletter and say, hey, look at this. A few people clicked into it. Community of practice, I we set it up for an hour and it went to, uh, you know, as a Zoom call uh, because people were so interested in hearing from us feedback on what worked and what didn't. And then I began to see people sharing with each other on what worked and what didn't in their context. I had um, community level staff sharing with community level staff on how they had solved the problems. And I'm like, hallelujah, that's, you know, my, my job was I went into community development, um, working in a community development field because I wanted to work myself out of a job. So that was really happy. I just worked myself partly out of a job. Um, and you can also in those feedback sessions then, be able to make tweaks to the processes, make tweaks to your story gathering, because they will be feeding back to you. You can open up the door for them to talk to you about it. One really important tool, and I, I, I suspect that many of you have this already, is using some sort of a template. Um, this can be for interviews. It can be used for doing a video. Um, just having a template that people can fill out. Three or four simple questions. Um, the ones I've used have been more, um, uh, more involved but they came after some training. Um, but giving your staff a form, and I mean, it's it's a paper form. You have something in your hands that you can sit down and it reminds you of what questions you need to ask. You may not need to have write much on it. Most, many people I know are using a phone to uh, do a voice recording of, the, of an interview that they're doing or of a discussion or a conversation. And they're... Um, and then they might transcribe it later or listen back for it. And using the paper to do things like write names of communities clearly, because sometimes in my milieu that I was working in, um, I had to figure out how to spell the community name. Sometimes it was maybe the first time the community ever showed up in print. Nobody knew how to write the name. So I had to figure out how to spell it. Um, and, and that also, I found that it gave people good confidence. I have done a, a, quite a bit of group training in, in story gathering where we were doing um, uh, role playing interviews and uh, we um, uh, or they would go out and, I, and even in that role playing, I was using program participants, members of the community. Uh, I would bring them into the process and they loved it. It was like being part of a skit. And they absolutely loved that. They loved thinking that they were being part of or knowing that they were being part of making the community better, of being able to get God's story out there. Uh, and so those that's really, really fun to be able to do some of that. But having that template, I found, gave people confidence. And we started out with it. They would use the template. And in time, you know, you can do a story on the fly without one. And some of the disaster relief story gathering I've done, a piece of paper when it's raining isn't great, but... Um, but it really is helpful to get people off the ground. Uh, keep the form simple, especially if you're having to work in translation where you've got the person doing the interview is, it might be better if it's in Spanish to have the form in Spanish so that you're only in one, your brain's only in one language. Um, exception to this would be, um, oh, and then the other, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead here. You will have some staff, you may get rejection of something like doing a template from community level staff and, and people who are busy. And uh, over the years, I and they said, I just want to write out one paragraph or I and it usually is, a, you know, I get two pages with no paragraph ba breaks back. And those pages do things like omit the name of the parent. They omit the child's birth date. So I don't know how old the child is, child is in the story. Um, they omit any statistics about uh, how their how good their harvest has been or how how the grades have improved. And so um, I really want to push it back to that because what happens is you, they turn in that one paragraph thinking, okay, it didn't take me that much time. And then somebody in the central office ends up going back to them to get the edit details and even having to go back to the program participant to find them to get the edit details that they could have gotten if they had used the format. It ends up taking more time for the central office and ends up taking more time for the staff member. 
So that's, and, and I know I'm really focusing on written stories here. I mean, video is some, some ways video is quicker to be able to do the interviews with video, but the problem is oftentimes you really do have to transcribe it. Um, if you s turn a video over to somebody and it was 20 minute interview, somebody has to listen all 20 minutes. It's a heck of a lot faster to read. And so, um, you know, I, I don't mean to hit so hard on um, having a written format to work with, but in the end, I think you're going to have to do the transcriptions. And there are quite a number of companies out there today um, that will um, take a video and, and do their level best to do a trans uh, to um, do a transcription on it. One of the exceptions too for that that I want to write the block story for you. You may have staff community participants and volunteers who are communications professionals or have a background and a talent for that. And that can be a great pat in the back to take what they have written or a video that they've produced um, and, uh, or video clips and use those. It'd be a real motivator to be able to use those and give them a pat on the back. Oops. Questions? Jonathan, back over to you. Yeah, I will just say there's one word that's just been screaming at me during this entire section, and that is the word intentional. Mm -hmm. And and so, right, what you're saying is don't wait for stories to just come to you. Go get them and, and plan for them. And I absolutely love, 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 love uh, making story gathering a part of people's job descriptions and job responsibilities, right? If you tell people they are responsible to deliver this to you, then that means they're going to be looking for those. They're going to have eyes open and ears open mm -hmm. and story gathering becomes part of the culture when that happens. So I hadn't really thought of just that simple step of incorporating that into what people and staff are responsible for. So just absolutely love that. We've got to be intentional when it comes to gathering stories. Jill from Mentor Kids says uh, this, Beth, could you provide some examples to include on standards to use um, for a person's uh, cell phone or for capturing cell phone videos? Is there a certain format? Is there a certain way you like to see those? What do you see out there? Uh my past experience was, and I, I don't, um, I'm not sure I want to play with my cell phone on camera right now to show you, but um, you know, the camera app on uh, both um, Android and iPhone, I happen to use an iPhone, does have a way to get into those standards and to set what the standard is on your phone. It, it's usually set low because they don't want to take up your, um, don't want to take up storage space on the phone. And so it may be that somebody has to go in and tweak that. Um, I don't know that I can come up with, uh, if I Googled it, I could come up with a tool on that too. But it, it's really simple. As, uh, and, and one of the ways that I'll do it too is to have people check the quality level when they send it in. Uh, and we found the best way to do it. Resolution is our key word. And some of you are, are um, if I had everybody up, I could probably see a lot of heads nodding right now. You have real resolution problems when stuff comes in, particularly if you're using email to send it. Um, or WhatsApp, that's the other one. Oh my goodness, the number of photos I've gotten over WhatsApp because of disasters. But the problem is WhatsApp automatically compresses the photo and, and you know brings it way, way, way down and to the point where it's almost unusable in anything. It's great to be able to share and say, hey, look at this photo, but you can't, you can't even put it on a, a social media by the time they get done with it. So I've usually used a, a two-sheeter, I mean, a one-sheet that that just says, this is where your camera settings have to be. It needs, I want 30, at, at least 70% of your photos to be vertical, be um, horizontal rather than vertical. That's something we have to, everybody takes pictures like this. Those don't work very well in print publications. Um, I've also, I've said, here's the file size. And we usually found that, I've usually found that um, if the file size for an image is two megabytes or higher, then you've probably got a good enough image to work with. Anything under two megabytes is tough, which means, implies that you have to have a technology that allows them to transmit a two megabyte photo. Um, Jill, does that help? Or I mean, is there, um, it's that resolution um, setting, you know, it, it, and they usually, a lot of times on the phone, it just says high, highest, 
good, fair. You know, it doesn't even have numbers. You want to set it toward the top. And you may have to experiment with the phone to be able to do it. That's where it gets into. Sometimes it would be better to have a, a central uh, camera or phone, a digital camera. They still sell those uh, that you can set, have the settings set, and then get people out there so that you're getting that two megabyte or larger image. And of course, you need much larger images for um, <clears throat> big websites and things like that. But if you need them that big, if that's where it gets to be the time of somebody tells you, well, I need a you know, huge resolution. Your resolution isn't good enough for web. You might need to look at getting a professional in there to do the photos. Yeah. And I would, and I would say all the things that Beth is talking about right now, figure that out on the front end. Don't mm -hmm. wait until something great has been captured and then you realize it's not going to work. And mm -hmm. so experiment with it, test things out, mm -hmm. um, uh, identify the specs that you need and want and make sure that everybody understands that. And Beth, you said one thing quick. Um, you were talking about uh, taking vertical pictures. Uh, when you only take video vertically with your phone, that can lock you in in some ways too. That's not that great. And so again, you you really want to experiment with that. Sometimes if you video vertically, you're going to end up with a, a frame around that video that you don't want. You can't use it um, uh, uh, in a way that's as big as maybe you'd like. So again, this is all a part of, of being really intentional. So experiment, try things out, figure out what works for you and make sure that your, that your team understands that. So yeah, great stuff there. Beth, Daniel says that you mentioned that uh, when you're doing an interview, it can take time for somebody to get comfortable. <laughs> and, uh, and so do you, do you have any methods or thoughts on just how to break that barrier down a little bit or break the ice or help people get a little bit more comfortable a little bit more quickly? One of the things, and I, I skipped over this, unfortunately, but I, I have a conversation at the beginning. We talk about an informed consent. It's really important in the interview to make sure that they understand how the story is going to be used. A lot of discomfort in the interviews comes from people not understanding where the story is going. And if you can have that conversation, usually, and I usually do the conversation as somebody who often doesn't know the people. I don't know the program. I've gone into areas. I find someone who actually does know the person, for example, a staff member who does know them and they're sitting there. It's not just an interview. It's the three of us talking together. Um, that helps. But having that conversation, that can take five to 10 minutes to have that conversation and make sure that we're clear about how it's going to be used. And I can just watch people's shoulders relax. I had a whole bunch of people that I was out, um, in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, gathering some stories about how, how our, my organization had helped. And um, I, I had this retinue of like 10 people following me around and uh, I couldn't figure it out. It was expensive. It took like three different Toyota Land Cruisers to do it. And Haiti's roads were just awful. You know, everybody bouncing around these and, and not secure. I'm like, why do I have this retinue? And it turned out they all thought I was from USAID, which was our founder, funder. And they thought I was doing the USAID report to decide whether the program would continue or not. And mm -hmm. so if I had had the conversation about my purpose, I mean, the, the interviewees had been told that as well. So as I'm talking with the interviewees, they're like, oh, everything's great. Yeah, because they wanted it to continue. And so uh, I needed, you need to have that conversation up front that helps people to relax. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I love that. Just taking those few minutes yeah. to connect personally, let people know, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Uh, here's how uh, we're planning to use this. Is that okay with you? Different things like mm -hmm. that. And like mm -hmm. you said, you'll just see a physical difference with somebody relaxing Mm -hmm. when they understand that. And then that allows conversation to, uh, mm -hmm. to flow quite a bit more, uh, quite a bit more uh, smoothly. So, and tell me your story is a good, you know, just tell your story. I, I can be directive sometimes with people to get stuff out of the way. And I try to ask questions that are less emotional to start with. I start with the factual stuff mm -hmm. and then, you know, I'm good 30 minutes in, I might start asking the emotional. And I learned that um, with the hard way to a degree, I was talking with a woman, um, in Bolivia, again, when I was there doing an interview and, um, and you have to learn which questions can be emotional. I asked her third question in, how many children do you have is the way that I phrased it. I was working in Spanish. I said it in Spanish. Um, how many children do you have? And her response to me was living or dead. Mm. And I realized, oh my goodness, you know, in this context where 20% of the children are dying before their fifth birthday, 
you know, asking that question can be a very emotional question because I saw her face just tighten up. And so you think about that, that becomes a very emotional question. I started putting that further down or I rephrased it and said, how many children are currently in your household? And that, that makes it factual and less emotional. Uh, yeah. So that's another wow. good thing too. Yeah. Understanding your context. And yep. yeah, absolutely. Well, and I learned that that interview made me think I'm, even though I speak Spanish, I generally work through an interpreter when I do interviews in Spanish because they know how to phrase the questions more politely. And the interpreter can shoot me a look and say, you don't want to, you don't want to ask that. I've had that sometimes too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great. Well, let's uh, let you get back into on, it yeah. here. And uh, that that's it for questions right now. Okay. Um, I, I don't have much left to go. These are two slides, but I think that they're very important here. Um, I've been mentioning about motivating, motivating staff, motivating volunteers, um, even motivating your program participants. Uh, and seeing your story, the story that you either wrote or even your own story in print can be a huge motivator. Um, one of the things I chose not to get into too deeply today was about what if I'm working with a population that is very vulnerable? And I mean, I've worked with people who are domestic violence survivors, I have and, and, and sexual assault survivors. I've worked with uh, people living with AIDS, uh, where we had to use pseudonyms, um, and uh, we had to be kind of protectionary. And you would think, you know, oh, gosh, they don't want to tell that story. But many times, especially if they'd really overcome something, they want to tell the story. They want to see that in print. They want to talk about how God has been so good to them. And so um, it, it is a motivator for them to see their story in print. So if, um, and, and, and so that's, they may not be as happy. Like if you take a staff member and you ask a staff member to share, for example, their own transformation story and put that in print, it can be very motivating. I cannot guarantee they'll be as happy as the people in this picture, but they will be, could be motivated to give you more. Um, when you're working with uh, staff, let's, let's say you form a community of practice of everybody in your organization that's doing um, doing work, that's a simply that's like sign, uh, assigning a committee. That's something someone could put on a resume. Um, they could put a line on the resume, part of the communications community of practice. It can be very helpful that way. Um, and I do want to mention this sidebar about it's kind of motivation, but it's. Um, you know, using stories internally, it, identifying good storytellers can be one way of identifying a good leader, uh, somebody who would rise in the organization, because particularly somebody to be at a level where they're having to do fundraising, having to work with major donors, having to work with foundations, uh, they need to be good storytellers. And it doesn't have to be a good stand up. I don't mean that they're great at standing up on a stage. Not everybody's good at that but they at least have to be able to do good one-on-one -on -one storytelling and they need to be able to identify a story when they see it. Um, you can't discount professional credentialing expertise and excellent interpersonal relationships, but telling a story to bring a donor into the work um, you know, is really, really helpful. I can think of two people that I've worked with over the time that started out as the lowest level of community um, development who are now at regional or country level positions in the organization I used to work with and their communication skills. We noted that early and began using them to do some of our communications and therefore move them into positions that really relied on that. And that my friends is the end of uh, my storytelling for today. I've just scratched the surface here and I wanna emphasize I am available to do consulting work on many aspects of the story gathering process. You can see here my, um, um, it's my uh, URL is story-gather.com if you'd like to take a look at some of the um, aspects that I'm comfortable in working with. Um, and I'm willing to break our time together into smaller modules so that you can spread it out over uh, several fiscal years. Because as I mentioned, this is not something you're going to do in six weeks. It's, it takes some time. Um, let me know where I can help. And you have been so helpful to me in, in giving me time to put this together. So again, we can finish up and take some questions. Wonderful. Yes. And uh, uh, when we send out all the follow-up information, we'll send out Beth's contact information as well. And so again, feel free to follow up with her. Maybe you've got a quick question. Um, she'd be happy to answer answer that. Um, maybe something comes up in the next few weeks or you, or maybe you need to, to um, uh, connect with Beth for a, a longer term project connected with your organization. So we'll send out all of that contact information. Beth, thank you so much. Let's do this, everybody. Feel free to unmute yourselves 
uh, right now. We don't need to put everything in the chat box anymore. And uh, I would like to ask one question to get the conversation started right now. Um, we've talked about intentionality and uh, right, making sure that we are uh, putting in parameters on gathering stories and how we want to gather stories and, and really working that in to be part of our culture. How are some of you right now gathering stories from your team? Are there tools that you are using that we should know about? Do you have a unique way that you're doing that? Uh, what, what are you guys doing out there? This is Jill with Mentor Kids. So we have provided um, a story template. However, I don't think it's working very well. So I took a lot of notes. Um, I mm -hmm. One of the reasons we have so many, many staff on today was to just help explain the importance and how to gather this. Um, I don't think I've done a very good job in helping our team make that connection. So I'm hoping, Beth, I think what you've shared today was absolutely awesome. And um, I felt like you were right on target. You had some really good suggestions. And um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it ha will help us kind of turn a corner in how we, we present um, the impact that we're having. Thank you so much. I, I really value your kind words, Jill. Yeah. How are some of you gathering stories out there? What are you, what are, what are you doing out there? This is Mary with She Is Safe. We go um, out to the village. I over and oversee the work in Nepal. We go out to the village, but through our partners, we're sitting down and the word Jonathan was talking about intentional I was gathering more information uh, of, I love the story temp or the, uh, yeah, the story template, but we are, um, yeah, just going into the village and sitting down with the ladies gathering the stories. Um, sometimes, and I think that's where the um, template will come in very handy is the, um, we don't always ask the same questions. You know, you're on the spot, you're enjoying a cup of tea, and then you forget to ask, how was your life changed? Or how was your life before? Or, you know, those important questions that you want to see the change in. So, yeah, uh, this is this is super helpful. But we are very intentional about visiting the ladies in their home mm -hmm. and sharing that cup of tea with them. Mm -hmm. One reason that I like the the um, template um, is that you know most most people don't in most cultures in this world don't don't tell stories in a straight line. Um, I would say the graph looks like this, and then a little like this, and then like this. And so one of the good things about that is that you can make some notes on that and say, oh, I already covered that, you know, and they they already talked about that, or I missed that. But um, and I love that. I love those circular storytelling. I call it. I just love it. I was talking to an organization a while back and they said that they use the the tool Slack and that they have a, an open Slack channel that's devoted to story gathering. And so they keep that open and their staff, um, as they hear about life change or uh, mm -hmm. stories or situations that should be looked into further, they put them all there. So everything ends up in one place and, uh, and then they take the right next steps from there. Uh, or maybe they have a full story to share. Um, that's where they share it. And that's sort of the central location for mm -hmm. that. So again, how are you getting intentional and how are you creating a culture of story gathering and putting that expectation on your team that that's something that they need to be responsible for? Um, how about just as we wrap up here, what's one thing that uh, Beth shared that maybe stood out for you or an action step that you feel like you need to take as a, as a result of what you've heard today? Maybe three or four of you just weigh in on that and then we'll, we'll close. This is John. Um, I think um, one thing that stuck out to me was the idea of the story of one um, within the larger within the larger story, the story of one. I think that's really a powerful idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say this, 
think through what that story of one is that really communicates your mission and vision. A lot of times people will say to you on the spot, right? Hey, what do you do? What are you guys all about? If you can share that story of one in a couple of minutes, that really helps people grasp who you are, what God's called you to do and, and what you're making happen out there. And so, uh, again, I just think that's a, a, a huge point that Beth made today. Sometimes we're too big and broad with our stories. And so how do we drill down on those and share about the life change that that happened with one individual or one family uh, that, that really helps people capture the, the heart of our ministry? Yeah, I love that. How about a couple a couple others? What's what's an action step or something that you want to put into practice? Hi, this is Laura Soto with Mentor Kids. So one of the action steps that I want to put into practice about gathering stories now is just engaging our staff and even our volunteers. Um, I think we've I've focused on you know talking to our students and looking for changes in them, but. I think the staff and the volunteers is a new perspective and I'm excited to implement that. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. How about one more and then I'll, I'll close for us if there are no other questions. Jenny, yeah. it looks to me, I'm no Zoom expert, but it looks to me like you, you want to say something. So I, fire away. I was just so grateful for the question of how is God working? I think that's such an important question to remember. And then um, as we're being intentional about relationship building and working with our guests um, and with our staff and with our volunteers, it's just an important reminder of what the Lord is doing. And then we get to share that. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So yeah. Much. What is, what is God doing? And I, I put in the chat earlier and I'll just, I'll just say it again here. One of the things that I try to, to get in the rhythm with at Venture One Nine is I get to the end of a week and I think, what what happened this week that was great? And, and who else should know about that, mm -hmm. uh, right? And so maybe that's uh, a quick email to some donors or supporters. Maybe it's uh, building out uh, a bigger story or a testimony as a result of it. But, but uh, I've told organizations this before, Beth, uh, just go into your calendar and every Friday or maybe every other Friday, just, just put in the note that pops up uh, what happened this week that is worth sharing. And, uh, and it just, again, it, it, it helps you think about what God's done this past week. Maybe something extra special happened. And then, of course, the next question is, who needs to know about this? So, so just constantly reminding yourself to be on the lookout, like Jenny just said, for what God is doing. And, of course, who else we can share that with. That's all a part of creating a story gathering and storytelling culture. All right. Anybody else? Last comments, last questions. Everybody good? All right. Well, Beth, thank you so much for your for your time today. Again, everybody, we will send out the recording or post the recording and we'll send out the PowerPoint for you. And uh, feel free to follow up with Beth and let us know how we can continue to to uh, to journey with you to, to, to help you do what God's called you to do. Let me take just a minute and pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for Again, just this time together, these few minutes today, God, I thank you for uh, for Beth's uh, uh, passion and energy connected with this topic. I thank you for her expertise, and I just thank you for speaking to us through her today. Uh, God, we're all in different places today, and uh, that's a wonderful thing. And so I just pray, Lord, that as we uh, disconnect from this call, that you will just continue the conversation with each and every one of us and just identify maybe a step or two that we need to make. Uh, and also God, maybe just nudge us about that, that, that one person, that one story that we need to, to figure out and find out um, so that uh, people can come to understand the work that you're doing through our organization in, in an even greater way. So God, thank you for these leaders. 
bless them in a special way as they just continue to, to work and build your kingdom and advance the gospel. And we just thank you so much for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.